Hi guys, it's Bill and we're back to working through our sample project, but now we're turning our attention in a slightly different direction. We are learning about JUnit testing. So let's talk a little bit about unit tests, testing in general, why we need to do these things, etc. And then we'll jump in and do some coding so that you can see how to create these unit tests. So the first thing that we want to note here is um, this is a hard thing for programmers to get their brains wrapped around at the beginning our brains want to believe that our work is good and complete and perfect. So writing tests is a little bit against our nature. Uh, while we, we know that we need to do it, or we hope that we know we need to, it sometimes seems like, why would I do this? I know I was careful. Well, even if you're careful, you make mistakes. When you copy and paste, you make mistakes, right? When you're uh, coming up with your uh, comparison operators, you make mistakes. You say less than when you should have said less than or equal to. So we do make mistakes mistakes. We do overlook things and make these small mistakes and JUnit testing is going to help us find those things because when you're at work you want to make sure that the stuff that you turn in is in good shape, right? You don't want to turn in stuff that's got uh, obvious bugs. So let's talk just briefly about that. Um, unit tests are testing in the small. We are looking at one class. We are looking at one method. We are making sure that these little pieces are working properly. It is not integration or systems testing where you're integrating a whole bunch of different stuff or the whole system start to finish. We are not doing testing in the large. We're doing testing in the small. And that says make sure your stuff to the best of your ability that your, uh, t your stuff, your classes that you write, your supplier code is well tested. Right? Also, know that that's very common today to be asked to do those two things, right? You should expect when you go out into the world that you're going to turn in your production code, and I call it production to contrast it with test code, right? Your production code is the main stuff that you're writing. So very commonly today, you are asked to turn in your production code and your unit tests together. Right? You're supposed to turn in both of those at once. So again, we are going to look at those testing in the small, each class, each method. Also, there are two kinds of things within that that we're going to write, two different kinds of things that are very typical. One is stuff that's happy path. Happy path says, yeah, sometimes, a lot of time, most of the time, the client calls us with exactly the parameters that we expect, with exactly the values that we expect, and life is happy, right? Everything is good. But sometimes they don't, right? Sometimes they give us data that is incorrect. They pass us negatives when we've said not to. They pass us nulls when they shouldn't. And so you also need to make sure that when you have exceptions being thrown, that the tests know to check that as well, because the code should fail in that predictable way when you're writing uh, this kind of test. So uh, we know that uh, we need to test both of those things, and it's going to increase our confidence that things are right. Now, um, I know that, again, this is going to be a little challenging for your brain, so here's a little tip. When you write your tests, think about not writing tests for your code, but writing tests for somebody else's code, right? You have a friend in the class and you think, you know what, hmm, that Chris, I bet Chris didn't think of this. I bet Chris did not code this correctly. So if I write just the right kind of unit test, I bet it would find a flaw in Chris's code. Some teams in, in the industry will actually do this. For instance, you could do partner programming where you're writing the unit tests and your partner's writing the code and then you switch, right? So, so both of you will do that and that way it's a little more of a game. It's a little more fun. All right. So those are just a couple of tips for what we're going to do to get started here. All right. So uh, Java has good support, has a testing framework called JUnit. It's very common. It's built in, right? A lot of IDEs have direct access to it. Uh, BlueJ even has access to it, but, uh, but IntelliJ certainly has even better access. There's a couple of different versions. Unit, uh, JUnit 4 was used by BlueJ, but we're on JUnit 5 now, right? It's more modern, so we're going to do that, and that's IntelliJ will support either one. So the general idea is for every production class, this should not say test, for every production class, you're going to create a test class, right? And then, generally, for each method, you're going to write one test method, right? 
And so we're going to think about that and we're going to code a few of those things. So I think we can I think we can jump over and actually start coding here. So let's again start sort of backwards. And again, I would have recommended that in general we write the bank account class and then we test it. Like we don't go on to bank because bank is counting on bank account being solid. So before we even move on, I would write bank account and I would test bank account. So how do I how do I get started with the test? Well, first of all, uh, it's easy because I'm going to click on the name of the class. I'm going to bring up my context actions with Alt Enter or right click and say show context actions. And one of the context actions is going to be to create a test. Right? And the first thing it says is, hey, you haven't made any tests yet. So where do you want me to put this stuff? Is it okay to put it in the same source root? And I'm going to say sure, it's okay. In the world, you may want them to go into a different folder, right? You may want to create a separate one because maybe you don't ship them in the same way. The source code gets compiled and, and shipped. The test code doesn't get shipped to, to users typically, right? To, to end users. But in this case, we can all put them in the same and it's it's completely fine. Uh, then it brings up this dialog and one of the questions is what kind of JUnit version do you want to use and we're going to use 5. Notice that uh, some of the coding was very similar in in 4 and 5 but some of it is not. Particularly the precondition testing is very different, right? So if you set up the wrong uh, JUnit framework, then you're gonna you're gonna have trouble writing those kind of tests. A uh, couple of things that we can do. These are little pieces that we may not use yet, but I'm gonna go ahead and click them uh, because you can have this these methods that are run before every one of your test methods and or after each one of your test methods, right? So they are sort of set up and tear down for for each test. So I'm just going to do them so you can see them, but you may you know you may may not use them now. The other thing that's cool here is. Uh, they will set up, allow you to set up uh, some templated tests for each one of these things. It's not going to write all your code, but it's going to at least create sort of a stubbed version that's ready to go. So you can go down here and you can just click each one of these things and say, you know, yeah, I'm, I want to test all of these things, right? I'm going to want all of them. Now we may, we may fix them up a little bit, right? But I'm just going to go ahead and click them all and say, yeah, I'm fine with that. Click. Click them all. Make some make some tests for each one, and then I'm going to say, oh, it says JUnit library not found in the module. You can say fix, and it'll say, hey, you know, let me go and get that and put it in the uh, make it accessible in the project. So I'm going to say okay, all right? And then I'm going to say okay, and notice it's going to fix all of these things. And then you know there's going to be some stuff that still needs fixing. I'm going to Alt Enter, and it says add library to the class path. Sure, right? So that made uh, that go away. You can also shorten these things because why say all of this? And again, then Alt Enter and say import the class, right? I can do the same thing with this thing with after each, and then press enter, import class, and then again here with test, right, import class. That way you can just shorten all this code. Why have the, the whole tag that's long when you can avoid it? And then in the future you can just type at test, right? So I'm just kind of cleaning these things up. I just don't want to have a bunch of extra code sitting there to, to catch my eye. Great. So now we're all ready. Again, these we probably won't use right now, but these would be run before every one of our test methods. You know a test method because it says at test, right? So I'm going to now want to start testing my bank account. So one of the things that I can do, I can actually put these things side by side if I need to, right? I can right click and I can say, where is that? Uh, you can split. Right, so you can split the two things and see them. I don't have the screen real estate with this resolution, but you can split them and have them side by side if you need. All right, so let's talk about how do we test a bank account. Let's talk about just the very basic test, which would be the constructor, right? I would say at test, and I would say void, public void, uh, constructor, right? I want to test the constructor. Now notice that tests tend to be public void and they don't have parameters, right? Because you're not calling these things, the test framework is going to call them. So all of these are going to be really simple. Uh, I recommend not writing Javadoc, but making good names, right? Make sure that the names of your methods are very uh, contextual, very descriptive of what they're testing. So if I want to test the constructor, how do I do that? Well, it's a 
class. If I want to test the constructor, I'm going to have to instantiate something, right? I'm going to have to make a new bank account, right? And when I do that, it's going to say, hey, I need an owner, Joe Schmo, right? I need an account ID, one, two, three, four, five, six. And I need a balance, a starting balance of $350, okay? So simply by instantiating, I have I have tested to a small extent the constructor right because if that were to blow up if it were to fail by throwing an exception unexpectedly uh, then that would certainly help me but I'm kind of unsatisfied that I've really tested the constructor well so maybe I'm gonna store that thing uh, bank account test account equals right so now I've tested that it is succeeding and also that I am storing the reference to it. That's great. But I also feel like it would be really great to, to test the, the get methods because if this stuff didn't find a home, if I can't turn around and retrieve this information, I don't think the constructor really worked, right? I haven't really proven to myself. So I tend to do, you know, constructor and the simple get methods, right? So I say, now, here's the important step when you're writing tests, and that's that you want to verify that the thing is correct. We don't just want to run it, and we're certainly not going to print, right? Testing is not a place to print stuff. It's a place to verify stuff. The way that we do that typically is with a thing called assert equals. And in the first part of this, you're going to uh, say what you expect. So for instance, I expect Joe Schmo to come out when I call testaccount.getOwner, right? That says, hey, I believe that the result should be Joe Schmo when I call testaccount.getOwner. If it is, then that's a passed a passing test. If it's not, you'll get a failure, right? It'll it'll stop this particular test method. It'll bail because it's found a, a problem and it will record the fact that, hey, this did not work out the way you said and you'll see in the test results uh, that, that Joe Schmo is, is, uh, is right or wrong, right? You'll see that, that the wrong thing came out. So now we can go down the line and do the same thing with the account ID, right? Assert equals. I assert that it should be one, two, three, four, five, six when I call test account, oops, account dot get, uh, get ID, right? And then last but not least, we're going to do the balance assert equals and I expect the balance to be 350 when I call test account dot get balance. Now one thing that you need to know is when you are comparing floating point numbers, remember that floating points are never stored exactly. They are always stored as approximations. Because of the way floating point math works, because of the huge range of numbers that are supported, uh, because of, you know, hopefully you've studied a little bit of this stuff with, you know, with, with these things having to be powers of two, floating point numbers are not stored exactly, right? So one of the things is we have to be careful because depending on how you calculate two floating point numbers, they can be a tiny bit different. Have you ever been working with your, you know, a simple calculator, maybe you're uh, reconciling your checkbook, and you look down and you see, you know, 350.000001, and you think, where did that fractional one come from? Well, that's because of floating point math, right? Floating points do weird things. So when you are comparing a float or a double, you need three parameters, not two. And that third parameter is how far away is close enough? right? And I would say, hey, that better be, right? That better be within a fraction of a cent. It better be correct, right? Pretty, pretty darn close. Certainly within a tenth of a cent, right? It has to be closer than a penny. It can't, it can't be a penny off. That would be bad, right? But a fraction of a penny, sure, it's maybe you get a, a weird fractional result. So normally assert equals takes two parameters, expected and then the actual, the call that gets the thing. But when you're comparing floating point numbers, it takes three parameters, right? Now let's stop and just, uh, we're going to have to stop the video because this is getting a little bit long here, but let's just test and make sure that this is working. I can just run one test by clicking this and saying run test, right? So I'm going to click that, run constructor and gets, and you'll see if you just run the one test, it's going to build your project, and then you will see at the bottom, uh, 
you know, whether it passed or failed. So here it showed, hey, I tested this thing, L green check marks all the way down, finished with a exit code zero, that's a positive result. So everything passed just fine. Let's make it fail so we can see the difference. Let's, let's make an, uh, a mistake of forgetting the O. All right, and now let's run it again. It'll build it, it'll, pass, it'll run it again, and you'll see now that it failed, and it says, hey, I expected Joe Schmo with an O, but the actual result was an E. Oh, I see, right, I see what I did wrong. I see that I just mistyped it here, right? So now I can finish, fix that, I can go back and I can rerun that test, and you'll see that it passes. Yay, okay? So that's a quick introduction to testing, unit testing, J unit. We'll come back and do some more with this in the next video where we will follow up and test the rest of our stuff and talk a little bit more uh, you know, in depth about, about testing. So thanks for watching this one and we'll look forward to seeing you in the next video.